Hello, everybody. Welcome to this section number three. Uh, I hope you enjoy the, the virtual the virtual lunch uh, supplied by by the organizers. Uh, and uh, for any more details, I, I would like, of course, to, to, to thank very much uh, Scanbalt and um, all, all the organizers uh, for this remarkable, remarkable forum. Uh, I, I would say that, that uh, I'm sure that this will be reminded as an important step towards uh, an European common data, data space in health. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and who I am and where do I come from? My name is Joaquim Cunha, and I am the executive director of Health Cluster Portugal. But I would say that the better way to open this session will be to launch a first, a first pool. So I'm asking our friends of the Regi to activate it. Uh, we'll, we will have one minute to collect your answers. And it's easy, it's yes or, or, or no. Uh, there is the, the question, and as I said, you have only to choose yes or no. As we all agree, COVID-19 crisis is an excellent scenario to discuss the better, and let me say, the intelligent use of the data and the, the digital to support a better quality, quality of life. In, in this forum, distributed, as you know, by, by four sessions, we are discussing and benefiting from the sharing of experience from all over, all, all over Europe on cross-country collaboration on health data exchanges, on digital solutions for the next generation of health, health research, on digital solutions for appropriative elderly care and healthcare systems, and on digital solutions for a resilient population protection, this particular, particular one. In fact, COVID-19 has underlined the need for a consolidated and harmonized European digital infrastructure. The future of the European idea of open borders and freedom of movement relies also on those technical solutions. Always present during this day is the idea that brings all of us together of a common uh, European health data space. Uh, it's a nice ambition, I would say. As uh, the joint declaration in a clear and opportunity way, try to state. This journey is for sure a decisive contribution to this, to its final format, the format of, of the joint declaration. So let's Let's go to the, the, the presentations. We have five presentations. Uh, uh, after what we will have a, 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 round, a round table. We will start with Toralf Schnell. Uh, Toralf Schnell is the Chief Digital Officer in the University Hospital of Griefswald, uh, sorry, in Germany. Um, and this presentation is uh, on the digital patient navigation, the use of digital solutions for a better handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemic. So let's hear Toraf. Hello, my name is Toraf Schnell. I'm the Chief Digital Officer at the University of Medicine in Greifswald. Today, I'm going to talk about the use of digital solutions for a better handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me give you a short introduction of my workplace. The University of Medicine Greifswald fulfills the task of the medical faculty in research and teaching as part of the University of Greifswald and in cooperation with other faculties, consisting of 21 clinics, 19 institutes, and further central facilities the University of Medicine Greifswald performs its duties as a maximum care center in our region. Since the founding in 1456, we as the University Medical Center rely on access to health information and data, including individual level data from patients. Therefore, it is so important for us to strengthen and extend the use and reuse of data and information 
And in my opinion, it's even critical in the digital healthcare sector for necessary innovations. We were facing a lot of challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. One of them was the wayfinding within our buildings. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, new requirements had to be fulfilled. For example, patients should have as little contact as possible with other patients, staff members, or objects such as door handles. No unnecessary walking in the building should be allowed, and it must be possible to adapt the routing in an agile and very dynamic way, if areas had to be closed for a short time due to the virus. Entrances can dynamically change and may have to be redefined very often. Updating the existing analog signage in such a pandemic situation is very costly, will always be time delayed, and will never be accurate. The routing which most hospitals started with, for example, one-to-one -one patient guides who bring you to the right place in the building can hardly be continued for all patient groups outside to reduce the emergency operation. So what will the new normal look like once we are going back to our regular operations? We want to utilize location services to better deal with COVID-19 in our campus and in our clinics. The development and use of digital patient orientation with live indoor navigation and the use of tracking services will help us to improve the handling of the coronavirus. In order to provide support as quickly as possible and in compliance with data regulation and data protection rules, we will develop an application for digital patient orientation. We will do that in three steps. First of all, we will implement an application which includes step-by-step -step navigation. Then we will extend this to a live navigation system using our current infrastructure and even extending it. And third, we will then develop tracking services and use cases based on the first two steps. For example, we can then track devices, places, and even people. Just give me, uh, I will just give you a few more details on those three steps. The first step, the application itself, which already includes a step-by-step -step navigation, will already reduce the contact to digital routing, and it will already reduce the, one, the need for one-to-one -one patient guides. You will find the shortest way when you come to our campus using outdoor navigation, including finding the right parking space. That already will reduce the time you spend on our campus, and it will always show you the correct, the closest entrance and exit. Within our campus, you can use a step-by-step -step navigation, which already reduces unnecessary walking on our campus and our buildings. It will be available for Android, iOS, and we will also implement it as a web application into our website. And backend system will always give you the administration possibilities for a very quick and agile way, and it will always be up to date. And the second step, we will make it live and we make it barrier free because in the COVID-19 pandemic, it's not just for a few people, but it's for everybody and it needs to work for everybody, even visually impaired, physically handicapped people and all the other groups we want to um, look out for. So we will implement voice control and we will also implement audio and haptic feedback so that helps those people. Therefore, we will replace our current access points and will renew them. So it includes uh, Bluetooth low energy blind spots. And that's one of the very innovative ways we are doing it here in Greifswald. Will be enhanced using sensors and Bluetooth low energy beacons on our hand hygiene dispensers, which are already available. And we will need that and we will use that infrastructure to enhance our live navigation. So if that infrastructure is in place, we can then start implementing our tracking cases. For example, finding objects and places and people. We will introduce a patient wristband and we will make it easier for tracing and um, finding those spots where um, a COVID-19 pandemic may, might be started. As you can see on the picture, we can then visualize the data information we collected. We can start building some heat maps, and then we can work on those issues. 
We will analyze those highly frequented building parts and then build up some track and trace um, applications so we can easier find our respirators, our stretchers, wheelchairs, or even our blood culture bullets, which are going through the building into our labs. So that is basically what we are working on right now, what we are implementing and the challenge we have. Um, yeah, I think to wrap it up in the, in the end, it's important that we can challenge now um, and that we can face a challenge now with a solution which helps us to implement a digital patient orientation system and to work um, yeah, together with everybody. If you have any questions, and thanks a lot for your uh, attention. You can see my contact details here. Contact me directly or via any of the major social networks. Please follow the hygiene rules and use your country's tracing app. Stay healthy and take care. Thank you, Taraf. And now uh, our next, next presentation. It will be held by Isabel de Zeger. She is founder of My Data Global, uh, an initiative from Belgium and the United Kingdom. And uh, the, the title of this, uh, her presentation is uh, How to Optimize Prevention while maximizing mobility in COVID-19. Uh, my data approach for a responsible, uh, responsible and citizen-centric management of pandemics. Okay, let's go to hear it. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. And um, the, my presentation outlines a framework for responsible and citizen-centric management of pandemics to optimize prevention while maximize mobility in COVID-19. This is an initiative from My Data for Pandemics, a working group within My Data. My Data is an international nonprofit organization founded in 2018 with over 600 members, over 90 organizations um, from over 50 countries. We have 25 local apps in six continents. As of August 15, the COVID outbreak has lasted for eight months. At a global level, there are no signs that we are in control. The impacts on health, on the economy, and on education are massive. Medical treatment has had limited impact. While there is hope to have a vaccine by 2020, one, there is no certainty that immunity will last for more than a few months. At the public level, people have been confined at home for weeks. Social distancing measures were enacted and testing has been put in place to identify positive cases. Digital solutions have been deployed in different countries, including contact and location tracing, status tracking application, verify credential with test results. One of the main concern of this uh, different solution is to see if they respect the individual rights to data privacy. With all these measures, the pandemic is still active. So what do we need to do next? But mostly, what do we need to do differently? Taking population-wide measure is not sustainable. We need to be adaptive to a constantly evolving context. And for this, policymakers need data. They need data which are relevant from each individual. They need data which are interoperable across country. Relevant interoperable data is what we provide in the My Data for Pandemic platform. The solution is based on the premise that data covering a wide population requires three components. First, a digital solution under the form of a human-centric platform where uh, individuals provide data with permission. Second, we need interoperable data commons based on a great international standard such as HL7 FIRE. Finally, finally, we need trust from individuals by empowering them 
to decide which data they are ready to share, for which purpose, for which period of time, to give them full control. In the My Data for Pandemic platform, individuals are at the point of integration. Data are controlled by the individual and not for the individual. Data sharing across different stakeholders is based on permission management support by decentralized identity. Governance grounded in my data principle enable trust and platform adoption. With this, individuals can actually share their data into a population data commons. Individuals are fully empowered to control their data through three capabilities, a control panel, from where they can manage their data across different data sources, an intelligent assistant that can automate Monday tasks, and a digital wallet that includes a mobility and health score continuously updated based on evolving context. These three capabilities put individuals truly at the point of integration and enable them to contribute to the population data commons. In most solutions, data commons are derived from different data sources, which are aggregated and anonymized at population level, often without permission of the citizens. Report for authority and mobility services can be derived from these data commons. With the My Data for Pandemic platform, individuals' data are integrated within an individual data profile with the individual permission. The data profile are then aggregated and anonymized into the data common from which report can be derived for authority and mobility, but also for the individual themselves, including a mobility and a health score. The approach provides data privacy preserving, preserving high quality integrated data with much more reliable and up-to-date analytics and statistics. The My Data for Pandemic platform will be successful and that for us means widely accepted in use if it relies on trust and trust is derived from correct governance, which in our platform is grounded on the six My Data principle that you can see on the screen. This principle can be verified by individuals through a set of checklists available through the platform. The question is not if there is going to be a second wave of COVID-19, but how to prevent it as much as possible and to manage it effectively when it happens. This requires integration and sharing of personal data coming from different channels like mobility, like health, like employment. Data privacy should and can be respected by giving control to individuals while sharing their personal data into population-wide data commons. This work is the result of active collaboration across the My Data for Pandemic working group led by the following people you see on the screen. Please do not hesitate to contact me or any other people in this list in case of question. Thank you and good day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Uh, I have to, to make a correction. I present Isabel as founder of My Data Global, but in fact, uh, Isabel is founder of B Loba. Um, Sorry, sorry for, for, for the mistake. And now we, we step to the next presentation. Uh, it, it will be held by Duarte Skeda. Duarte Skeda is a project manager uh, in SPMS, is the uh, structure of the Portuguese Minister for Health, uh, the shared services of the Portuguese Minister for Health. And the presentation is of the project that um, uh, they, 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 they managed to uh, trace COVID-19. So we will hear large-scale case and contact management information system, first pilot 
in seven days after starting develop. Okay, that's going to hear what Wartscale has to told us. So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Duarte. I work for the Portuguese Ministry of Health. Uh, I'm here to present you uh, Trace COVID-19, which is an information system that we had to develop uh, for late large case um, contact management. Uh, and uh, we just developed this in seven days, the first version. So uh, I will explain everything for you. So the agenda for, for today uh, is to share with you some key learnings that we took some features and figures on this system and our future challenges along this challenge. So first of all, uh, I would like to share this first learning. So software is a function. Uh, if I want to give a lecture on trace COVID-19, as I'm doing now, uh, I could do a keynote at an auditorium. It could be a great talk, but everyone risks getting COVID-19. Or I can do a Zoom call as I'm doing now, and I could share learning safely with everyone. Trace COVID is practically the same. So if I want to track and follow up cases and contacts, all the public health doctors could write on an Excel file and call everyone in the list. And people uh, would get followed, yes, but information would be lost, would get outdated, and updating calling is really time consuming. So that's why we developed Trace COVID-19 in Portugal, so that people can self-report their follow-ups and information is constantly updated so tasks are not missed. And of course, people stay at home, which gives less pressure on emergency rooms and hospitals. So we started the development on 12 March. Seven days later, we, de we, developed, we launched the, the pilot. And on 28 March, we did the national rollout. So the second learning is that the team is key. We started with these two folks, and now we have 20 people gather along the development of this project. It's really important to celebrate with them the small victories, and of course, uh, I'll, uh, ask them to sleep uh, while they can. So the, the, first, the, the third learning that we had is that the software should do, uh, uh, live besides an intervention. And in this case, we are talking about public health surveillance. And Trace COVID assumed has a, a centerpiece in the pandemic management. So everyone in Portugal that has uh, symptoms of COVID-19 or it's a confirmed case or a contact of a confirmed case goes to co uh, Trace COVID so that uh, it gets uh, followed and monitored by uh, doctors. So the objectives of the platform is to streamline the tracking of cases and contacts, to ensure exhaustive follow-up, to automate and stratify tasks, to inform for local action, and to support multidisciplinary work. So these are the main features that we have. I will talk about them uh, later, uh, but I would like to say that the, 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 the two main actors in the, in the platform are the public health teams and the general practitioners. The fourth learning is that the success of the software does not depend only on the software. We have these five dimensions, it's published, you can, you can read uh, further on that, uh, but two or three of them are very important. The first is the people. So our users, uh, we really need to give them the power and empower them with, in this case, a public and a collaborative roadmap of all the features that we develop so that they can contribute on them and really feel that the system replies to their needs. In the second, uh, we really need to adapt to the local processes that each uh, healthcare unit has. So we made several webinars that joined together more than uh, 3,000 doctors in Portugal so that they can ex uh, understand the, the features of the platform and contribute on them. The fourth, in, in the fourth learning, uh, in terms of integration, we did several um, system integration with all uh, the systems that are important. The first of one is the, the Portuguese Master Patient Index, also the National Contact Center that receives more than 10,000 calls per day, the Citizen Portugal, the Portugal that we have in Portugal, uh, also the, the National Public Health System and the Stay Away COVID that will be the digital contract tracing app that will be launching next days. The fifth learning is that it's really important to ship early. Feedback is the most important. We really believe that the, the best approach is to have a minimum viable product that really uh, increments uh, day after day. The sixth learning is that we really need to compare with the alternatives. We didn't opt 
for using the, the WJO Go data because it has no data integration features. And the seventh and the last learning is that we have to prepare for the worst. We have uh, several challenges with the Portuguese Data Protection Authority. Uh, we would uh, we will uh, we will able to to deal with them, but it was really uh, difficult for us to to get together all these challenges. So the features of the platform, uh, as you know, uh, we manage all the suspect cases, confirmed cases, and recovered cases here in Trace COVID-19, so that public health uh, public health teams and also the general practitioners can do their job here. Um, Trace COVID allows for creation in, in the, uh, the individual records. It automates the entry of patients into surveillance and monitoring and allows for telephone monitoring. Uh, it also delegates to the patient the reporting of symptoms so that they can do their auto-reporting uh, in the citizen portal. Also, it enables the referral process between primary care and hospitals for patients who need secondary care. It allows to identify the status of each patient, of course, and allows the management of transmission chains and clusters so that we know uh, which one, con which case uh, contacted with each person. It also produces descriptive epidemiological analysis so that the, the national level, the regional level, and the local level can have a big picture of everything that is going on. It compares geographies, it identifies outliers, and also it has automatic georeferencing of active cases, new cases, and all kinds of states that the, the patient can have. Uh, we are all able to, 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 to tell a story of the pandemic. This is the, 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 the timeline of the active cases in Portugal. Uh, it's really interesting how we can tell a story by looking at these pictures. It also monitors the activity of primary care activity in COVID-19 patients. And because of that, we need and have future challenges. This is our roadmap. We have it since the really beginning. So the reds and the yellows, we are working on them, of course. And we have these seven uh, challenges. So we are going to, uh, it's really difficult to articulate with our CAIC systems that we have in Portugal, of course, and the balance between reporting and increased productivity is really quite important. Also, the permanent change management that is needed. Finally, some figures of the system. So we have now 800,000 citizens in the system, 1.7 million symptom reports done by phone or and online, 5,000 uh, 5, users, active users daily in the system. And these users performed around 2.5 million tasks uh, during the surveillance process. And for your context, Portugal has today 10 million population, 50,000 uh, confirmed cases and 1.7K deaths. So thank you uh, for, for, your, for your time. Keep safe and come to Portugal. You'll be safe here. You can visit us. You have like uh, an excellent weather. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Duarte. I, I, I support your, your welcome to everybody, to, to our country. Uh, the, the last, but of course, not the least, will be Emil Swindikov. He is co-founder of Quatum and the Computer Scientist at the University of Latvia. And the presentation uh, that he's bringing today is uh, the, the title Ecosystem for Collaborative Research Acceleration, Patient and Population Proactive Onboarding and Engagement into Research Initiatives. So let's go and hear Emil. Hello everyone, my name is Emil Sundukov. I'm CTO of Longenesis and represent Digital Health Cluster today. We'll be talking about within the framework of resilience, uh, tackling the pandemics and engaging the population. We'll be talking about one of the cornerstones we believe in, we need to solve in order to uh, attract and accelerate the collaborative research and engage population and patients proactively into these initiatives. So the uh, limitation for accelerating such research laid there in the industry, not only within the pandemic, field, but also far beyond, far before that, and uh, within the siloed and harmonized biomedical data sets, including also challenges within how we can, how we can onboard, proactively engage population cohorts and patients 
within the research initiatives, providing the digital bridge between the stakeholders. And the following challenges have long existed, also not only including technical, but also uh, legal challenges, preserving the local legislation and basically slowing down the whole process of collaborative research. And the speed of collaboration, especially in times of pandemic, is very crucial, as, far, as crucial as involvement of the various stakeholders in the process. So the COVID-19 already proved us and, you know, raised the awareness of multiple industry, uh, multiple industry representatives to look into healthcare sphere and uh, understand how we can solve this. And uh, I will talk about a little bit about Latvia, which is a small country tackling the pandemics, small country, but fast and efficient measure with a prevention. The first country in the world that launched the app that meets democratic standards to get the Apple and Google incorporations to engage proactively each citizen in controlling measures and understanding the outspread of the virus within the country. But this, uh, the, you know, within the preventive measures, it doesn't end only within preventive measures. We also should think about how we can engage various stakeholders, also including research initiatives, uh, industry and uh, population as well into the, into challenge, into this challenge, into solving this challenge together. And one of the logos here is a, uh, country country specific research program which was basically in involving various stakeholders all together within six months of working agile wise in order to tackle this within the industrial research initiatives so within the digital health cluster of latvia we are also tackling the above mentioned challenges and uh, as an example here we also represent two of them within uh, providing the overview of creating the common eu health data space preserving the legislation, preserving the privacy, but also engaging proactively each individual, each stakeholder of the process to create a collaborative framework within the EU or even wider. And this also gives us an ability to talk about the patient journey who are very important players in the whole cornerstone, a whole uh, pipeline of the research and also healthcare provision. So the cases, we are a small country, but we're represented by various startups tackling the following sphere. Uh, I will talk about Lengenesis a little bit later as one of the startups tackling, small Latvian, Latvian startup tackling the COVID challenge within the whole world, starting from APEC region, end up within US. So we're tackling three pillars of the whole research pipeline, which basically start, gives us uh, of the identification, providing the open consortium and preserving the data stays local principle, the local legislations, but enabling the collaborative research between multiple stakeholders, which are biomedical institutions, potential collaboration partner sponsors, and population cohorts, patient cohorts, governmental institutions, by providing the metadata, descriptive metadata within one curation framework, we initialize the handshake protocol, which is the collaborative research. And the second of all is digitized consent. So we already tackled the challenge of engaging proactively the patients and population cohorts within the process of research. And the end-to-end -end digitized consent management tool provides us this opportunity and being used from the Latvian start being used within the population genome program and COVID-19 vaccine within the Middle East region as an example, and also far beyond. As for the third pillar, and I will end here since we only have seven minutes of time, uh, as per the third pillar, the engagement tools providing us not only the identification of the partners, registration and onboarding, but also engagement them into the prospective research process in solving this challenge together is the disease specific digital tools, which uh, the case studies, including also the female oncology, which is one of the interesting cases that we're launching now in the Baltic region, is basically on the individual level providing digitized way how we can raise the self awareness and more precautious measure, uh, educative materials within the, you know, sort of individual level, but also proactively engaging the individuals within the research, creating the digitized bridge between the research community and individuals, female participants, to proactively be engaged and proactively participate in prospective research within female oncology field. But since we're speaking about the COVID-19 pandemic within the certain panel today, uh, the one of the case studies we are launching in a, in a, in a, in a one and a half months is also risk stratification within the individual uh, level, but also an ability to engage each individual by individualization of inclusion exclusion criteria within the prospective research, creating this digitized bridge between society members and research institutions and governmental institutions to fight COVID-19 pandemic together. And um, we'll be happy to talk both on the strip level, both on the ecosystem and uh, level in order to collaborate and fight this 
measure, uh, fight this challenge together and solve this challenge together. Um, thanks a lot. And I will be happy to talk and participate in the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emil. Uh, I think it's time to join, to join together. Uh, I will ask uh, the panelists to turn off, turn on uh, their, their videos and join, make a around, around, around table. Uh, before that, I, I will ask the, the Reggie to, to launch uh, the second, the second pool. Um, it will take us uh, one, one, one minute, and uh, if we have time, we'll discuss uh, both this one and the, the, the previous pool, the results. Okay. So, I would say that my, my, my first question uh, will start uh, uh, with. with I would say a reflection that that is that in, in what what in, in what measure uh, in your in your opinion uh, and in what extension the pandemic crisis worked the, uh, as a booster uh, in development and implementation of digital solutions that we saw here today and we, we have a, a lot of uh, examples all, all over Europe and all over the world of course. Uh, and how this could could work uh, as a booster, uh, or or is it, it is it is just a, a bubble or episodic phenomenon? Uh, I would like to hear your your thoughts on that. Uh, perhaps we can start by by, by the end uh, in a, in a reverse order. Perhaps if Emil is I don't I don't see him. Sure, I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. So, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. <laughs> that, sorry that's sorry. totally fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. So I will uh, quickly, uh, thanks a lot for uh, hosting me and, uh, and during the panel discussion. So basically uh, speaking of uh, COVID-19 as a booster, uh, in uh, our personal experience, both uh, from the startup level, but also ecosystem level in the region, uh, since what's happened to a very conservative field, which is healthcare, uh, one of the most conservative fields in the, in the yeah. industries, um, I think this was quite a booster and it's not only, you know, just a bubble or, you know, this is the moment when we should, under, when we stopped and understood that we need to digitize the process because otherwise, you know, both on the private healthcare level, also on governmental healthcare level, we would not, uh, we will not provide the same quality of uh, treatment, diagnostics, rehabilitation, and other procedures within the healthcare uh, domain. So, uh, from our you know startup perspective, we've received, uh, we boosted our consent management tool for a Middle Eastern uh, Middle Eastern uh, use case for the consent management within not only the COVID-19 uh, vaccine trials when they build a lab within two weeks <laughs> with MGI uh, in Abu Dhabi, but uh, also. Uh, doctors coming to, for, to us uh, and asking you know whether we know how to you know one of the one of the buzzwords how to apply ai for <laughs> data structure and analytics ending up with the business to customer tools when they can engage patients more proactively not inviting the whole pool and then you know stratify the risks when they're coming you know face to face but do this remotely so for sure in the short terms yes sure this is a certain acceleration and we should treat this as an opportunity to uh, to engage, to integrate more solutions, to uh, to ease the process, accelerate the process. Thank you. I'd like to hear perhaps to what using the the, the reverse order. But uh, I would ask also that to introduce it in your in your answers. Um, how the how, how how can we turn this this in a in a real opportunity? Uh, thank you, Joaquin, and, and all the, the colleagues of the panel. Um, well, I, I totally agree with, with Emil uh, on this. Uh, basically, I think there is new opportunities for in terms of funding, uh, regulation, of course, in terms of cooperation between uh, enterprises, the governments, and also with the patients. So that, that's the most important uh, that we need to face. Um, and in terms of regula regulation in Portugal, we did some steps 
uh, small steps, I, 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 I see, but with baby steps, I think we, we, can, we can achieve uh, better outcomes. In Portugal, um, we uh, use this opportunity to boost uh, our uh, national contact center. So we will launch a big contract, uh, around 30 million euros uh, contract uh, for the national contact center. Uh, it will be like a, a, a totally omni-channel uh, uh, contact center so that we can have more integration. Uh, we will also launch um, the telehealth platform that we have, I mean, uh, besides the table, uh, and now it, uh, it's totally uh, completed to, to be launched. So I think, of course, it, it's not a bubble. Uh, we, we are here to, to take the opportunity, uh, but we, we really need to, to tackle this, this challenge in a, in a cooperative way, and we, we need to cooperate uh, with all the sectors uh, so that it can go well. Okay, thank you. Isabel, if you please, if you could give us your... Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I think obviously there's always some bubble into all this, but at the same time, I think there's been that way to stay. And the thing that I believe are the most important for me are, are twofold. First is around data privacy and data. Um, I think this uh, COVID-19, with all those uh, applications that appear that they've not been respecting data privacy, has put data privacy at the agenda of many countries, but mostly many citizens. I think that people start to realize that the data have value and should not be used just like this. And that we can actually use good quality data at national level without infringing on data privacy. That, that's really about managing, and that's really what we do in my data, making sure that we can manage high quality data at population level with the permission of the people. There is no need to trade data privacy for data quality if the right solution is put in place. And I think that's for us an extremely important message because people say, and we've seen in Belgium any infringement in other country, or oh, we need those data for public health, therefore we can infringe on data privacy. Absolutely not. Um, the second, um, and, and we've shown we can do it and we start to do more and more pilots about that. The second thing is that, yes, there are other things that are, are going to remain. Um, it's about telehealth and I think, uh, I mean, you mentioned that or Tor, you mentioned that, but I think there's also another aspect. COVID is not just about health, it's about mobility. And um, a mobility problem created by a health problem. And I think there's been a lot of new approaches to health, which have nothing to do necessarily to the, the, the common data space, but I think will and hopefully will change our behavior in terms of, of travel. Do we need to travel? Do we need to go every day to work if we can do a lot of daily, uh, of daily work? Um, and I hope um, well, something will remain. I hope it will remain for a long time because many people can be very efficient as well. So I really think on those two aspects, data, data privacy, is absolutely no reason to actually um, uh, trade for both, they can go in common. And two, yes, our behavior will change around mobility and that's a good thing. Thank you. Thibault? Yes. Yes, if you please. Yes, um, indeed, I think that in the short term, um, this crisis uh, led to, to actual implementations of uh, um, innovations in, in the digital field, of course, as we have seen it during these presentations and, and uh, other examples are also available uh, before contact investigation, contact tracing, symptoms monitoring, uh, hospital surge monitoring. Um, I think that these solutions will not last more than the, the, the current outbreak because they are specific to, to this crisis. However, I think that what will last beyond this uh, current situation is the, the consciousness and namely in, um, in public administrations that a better data quality and better data management framework are needed in general. So that if we face the same challenges for an, an, another uh, epidemic or, or another type of crisis, the same kind of um, implementations uh, can go much faster. Um, it's not sufficient today that 
uh, we store data, we have also to make it interoperable between different services or agencies, and also to make it uh, understandable. Uh, that we, on, we not only store the data, but we give sufficient information to interpret it correctly um, across departments or agencies or regions that in, in, in the day-to-day the -day life do not collaborate together or do not exchange data. So to make it easier to do that in a context of crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Start off, can we? Have your your comments and opinions on? Oh sure, I just want to get back uh, once again to the question: Was it a booster, or and will it last, or is it just a bubble? Yeah, I think it definitely was a booster, and it will definitely last. I think in all other areas, we already saw like what digitalization can do. I mean, my car is basically driving itself and everybody streams nowadays yeah who is going to the video store anymore so i think it was definitely time for for this area for the healthcare um, business to get disrupted as well i think what was us holding back until now was basically that everything else was until the beginning of the year more important when it uh, came to the discussion on where do we invest that always little money we have in the healthcare system and it was never in digital solutions yeah. most of the time i mean sure everyone has this uh, clinical information system but that's basically it until today and for that i think it was a booster as you saw in, in my example for the digital patient orientation we are discussing that topic for a year two years and maybe even longer but it wasn't it, it didn't have the highest priority but now with, with Corona, and it's not only about Corona. I mean, we all know like all the different viruses and bacteria and what else you can have in a hospital. Um, it will help with that as well. But now it was a time to say, okay, we have to move this forward. We have to put this to topic. Uh, we have to give this more importance. And, and um, for that, it was a booster. And it will last. Because I think what we are doing now with all those innovations we are implementing, into our healthcare system, into our buildings, into our hospital. Uh, that's, in my opinion, it's kind of, it's a platform we are building. What I do now for digital patient orientation is basically the platform for further topics, as you saw in the tracking examples, to find the bed, to know which bed is open, to know where all the other devices are, to know who meets whom maybe, and where uh, is spreading is actually starting. So it will help us what we are doing now with the boost to develop actually things that will last. Uh, we, we, one could say that uh, this gave, gave uh, spotlights to, to, to digital and to data uh, in what relates to health uh, and healthcare. And the next step is how, how, how can we take advantage of, of this in order to Absolutely. to uh, recover the the the, the 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 late development that the health in the global for, for the last years yeah maybe one thought on that as well because i think what uh, the corona pandemic did was actually that we all started to build something that helps us where we are in our region at our hospital and now the next step would be actually how bring this how do we bring this together and that's going back to how do we share data and how do we not only share data, in my opinion, because what I do now, I don't need to especially share the data where people move or where my open bed is. But I think what we should share is what we learn from the data. Uh, what, what, what did I learn in my hospital? What did I learn? We at the Baltic Sea, for example, um, we have different projects running because we are in a spread community. We don't have a lot of people in our state here. Um, we live close to the water, so how is wind affecting things and how is transportation going on and so on. So what we learn, that we should share and that data should also go into a European common platform so other hospitals can use those learnings and um, start from there and don't have to start from scratch. Yeah, this led me to, to the, the next question and somehow is, uh, um, is related. Uh, uh, because 
it's some some kind of uh, of um, we have to spread uh, this this to other 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 pathologies and other applications, but at the same time uh, we have to we have to face a, a nice challenge. Challenge is it, uh, how, how to deal this in a cooperative way uh, all of, all over Europe. Uh, I would like to hear your 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 thoughts. Uh, Perhaps we can start again by far off and then go go back by by by. Um, do you do you sure. agree with this? Uh, I, that's basically uh, where I left uh, my last statement. Yeah, it's like okay, yeah. what do we learn and how we can can we apply this to other applications, to other healthcare systems, and to other houses? And that's what I said. It's basically yeah. I, I think it's very important that we. Uh, don't search any longer in our example in our project I was presenting. Stop searching, find something. And I think um, it's, it's basically creating transparency instead of chaos. Yeah, I think most of you know like how hospitals work and uh, how they did in the past. I think now with those digital solutions, it should make things easier. And from my perspective as a CDO, not only it should definitely make things easier for patients but not only for patients because we are one of the biggest employers in our area so it would, should make things easier for our employees as well and for our partners who are working uh, there delivering food and all that stuff so i think there's a lot of room and a lot of potential for digitization and for things we implement there to share in other clinics and in other areas in the European Union. Yeah. Ivo, can, can you share with us your thoughts on this? Although I, I guess that you are, you agree. Ivo, it's not, it's not with us. Sorry, yeah. uh, the, yeah. my, my application just froze for a few seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I agree with uh, what has just been said. Um, I think that um, th there is uh, naturally this, this culture of reusing things that work uh, both from one situation to another, from one disease to another, but also from one country to another. Yeah. I, I will just give two examples, um, which include Belgium, because I, I know better this, this, uh, this country. Um, for example, in Belgium, you have two, two solutions for uh, contact investigation. Uh, the first one that has been put in place very rapidly uh, last spring was, um, and, and it's still in place, it's a, a rather manual contact investigation operated through a call center. And in fact, uh, this solution is, has not been invented for COVID-19. It's uh, already used for years for uh, tuberculosis. Of course, it, it, has, it hasn't gained um, so much visibility because the number of cases are much, uh, much fewer, but still the mechanics are the same. So that, that is uh, why it has been implemented first in a few weeks uh, last spring in Belgium. So the, this culture of, of reuse, things that work and, and with which uh, medical doctors were confident with. Um, another example is the, the second uh, solution for contact investigation that has been put in place in Belgium. It's a, a, a currently ongoing work, is the, the mobile contact tracing through, through mobile phones. Uh, and there, um, Belgium has decided to adopt uh, an open source protocol for communication of information, which is the, the rather well-known DP3T. So that also brings confidence because it's, uh, the, the way it works is completely made transparent to the public. It, it has already been used in other countries. And even, and even the, the mobile application itself that will be used uh, will be uh, largely inspired by the one that has been uh, released in Germany. So I think that both reusing um, mechanisms that work for other diseases, but also solutions that have proven useful in other countries I think it's something that already happened and that must be, of course, encouraged. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Uh, Isabel, can we have uh, your comments? On... Yes, uh, maybe I would like to start by saying something that a big statistician said in the US. 
which is without data, you are just another person with an opinion. Yeah. And I think what we've seen in this crisis is that even the top expert where people with uh, uh, an opinion absolutely no final knowledge. And so when you were saying there is that we just need to share lessons learned, I would completely disagree with you. I think we well, also need to how to share data. And um, it is possible to share data. And we have more and more standards in healthcare and in pharma, uh, be it uh, HL7, be it FAIR, be it SNOMED, be it MEDRA. I think everybody who's working in the sector should really push on those ones, which are more and more accepted by all government. Germany has those standards, Lithuania has those standards, all the country, UK. So I don't think today there is any excuse for not using healthcare standard. Um, because that costs a huge amount of money. And then um, the, the, the third one is about sharing. Uh, if I take your example, Duarte, you have about a, bit, a little bit less than 10% of the Portuguese population. With that, it's very difficult to actually there are very high quality information just because of the number from a statistical perspective and actually manage the prevention. The EU, we need to share and integrate it data across different data sources, your application and every other application that exists in Portugal, where you can actually start to triangulate data. So the first point is that we need to integrate data from many different data sources so that it starts to make sense. And two, we need to actually share data interoperable based on international standard across country. And that is feasible, that's being done, and that's one of the reasons of the health common data space being set up by Citra. There are major European projects on that. I think what is important is that people make the effort to learn what's happening outside and make sure that whatever it's built respect those standards instead of reinventing the wheel because they have a great ideas. And I think there's a lot of good wills. But I think let's make sure we respect what is being done to be truly efficient so that if there comes the next pandemics, we don't do the same mistake we did. We did a lot of mistake and it was not needed. We could have done a much better job. And that's where I agree with you on the lessons learned. If lessons learned about how to use the data better next time, yes. But that's really the critical point. Okay, thank you. Nice, nice, nice view. Uh, Duarte, can you add your thoughts? Just to, to compliment with the, the the previous uh, with Isabel, Isabel, you, you said that we only had 10%. In fact, the 10% that are there had something with, to do with COVID-19. We have uh, all the people, I mean, because we, lay, we integrate with the master patient index where we have all the 10 uh, million citizens that we have in Portugal. So it's linked. I mean, we have the identity linked. Uh, so it's perfectly, we don't have any duplicates and we can triangulate all the, all the information. Um, regarding uh, also this topic um, and uh, complementing Isabel also, uh, we have uh, another project uh, that we are doing uh, with other countries in the context of the e-health network uh, in Europe uh, that, uh, we can, that we call the, the patient summary. I don't know if you had heard about it. Uh, so we are uh, in the first wave of the countries that are using patient summary. So basically um, it, it's, it's like a, a, an interoperability project uh, in which where, uh, when someone comes to Portugal and has to go to the emergency department, for example, uh, the doctor can see uh, his patient's uh, summary. I mean, uh, like a summary of all the diseases, all the, the relevant information that the, the patient had in uh, its country. Uh, and the opposite also uh, happens. So when a Portuguese citizen uh, goes abroad to another European country, um, they can see there uh, the, the, his, inf his information uh, in, a, in, a, in an integrated way and in using standards like SNOMED, um, AGL7 for, for the transmission, of course. So I think we can benefit with the solutions that we, 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 we have. We can uh, consider all these experiences that we did during the pandemic like a, a big pilot of uh, new solutions. We have a lot, of, a lot to learn in terms of data management, I think. Um, but basically, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't add anything more. Thank you. Thank you. 
Emil, if you yeah. please. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. A couple of uh, a couple yeah. of things from my side. Thanks a lot, uh, dear panelists, for sharing this. So I think what is important here is that we are not only approaching this from you know upside down approach, but also trying to approach this from various sides. And if we look at the reality of working with practitioners, you know, uh, this is very good that we have you know very pan European or pan regional uh, initiatives when we are looking about the data management standards or approaches. But we also should look at to you know. It's not not from down upside, but basically in the reality of practitioner clinical investigator side or patient organization side, when in reality now they're using, you know, um, Excel's flash USB drives for passing the information. And this is a jungle, wild western. So we should create this not only, you know, saying, hey, we have, you know, AI, data standardization and big stuff happening here, cool guys sitting in the panel, but actually providing the incentive to each of the stakeholders involved and saying, hey, let's start, you know, with less painful solution, such as like sharing metadata as an example is a one way of doing this and providing the incentive straight away. If you do this, you're a part of consortium and you're, you know, as investigator applying for more uh, research projects, publications, the KPI growing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As a patient organization, you are more proactively involved. You're receiving better treatment and, you know, being a part of this process. And then we can also grow this from both sides, you know, and uh, meet somewhere, I hope, connect by, by meeting, not just, you know, the video of building bridges from two sides and then <laughs> not connecting it all together. But, uh, and this is the approach, you know, that we're using. This is one of the approaches when we can use the metadata to actually uh, uh, com comply with the data states local principle, but actually showcase that there is a certain cohort of inclusion criteria or biomedical data set matching the interest of potential collaboration partner sponsor, and then using the uh, curation consortium to understand, oh, wow, this is the investigator who can get me the patients of my interest and, uh, you know, incentivize both of the, both, uh, both of the stakeholders involved. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know if, on this subject, if someone has to want to have anything else, otherwise we'll jump to uh, because the time is running out. And my my idea is that we can see the the results of the pools and perhaps uh, have some comments on on. So I, I asked Regie if if they can display the result of the first of the first pool. If possible, uh, let us see. While we wait for that, Rakim, uh, yeah, 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 I yeah please. The question, I, I did not like the question because I think the question is a, a yes, no. Um, I'm happy okay. to share my my data under certain condition, and so yes, okay. I answered yes here, even though I felt like I should have answered no, uh, because I'm in between. I think that's also very important in all those discussion is the way we answer, we raise the question. It's kind of a black and white. Okay. Uh, you, you become mute, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what's muted, but anyway, just wanted to say we should not be black and white. There are yeah, okay. that allow not to be black and white. Yes, yes, I do, I do agree, I do agree. Is there any, any other comments on the on these results, and somehow that it's a, it's expected ones, but uh, and of course uh, it's it's difficult to have. Um, this one is from the the second one. This this is okay. If this I may, if I may comment again, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yes, if you please. Yes, if you please. Uh, I think obviously again the answer it should be yes on this. I don't think that's the question. The question is how can we make it happen fast? Yes. yes. For the yeah. next time, uh, yes. as you are talking in one of the question is how, and I think yeah. yes. yes. Data and uh, time. Yes, I, I think that the interesting part is uh, that the, this these issues are, are are now are now on the top of the agenda, but. The, the problem is not the, to say yes, because I think we are all agree on, the, on this. Uh, the problem is how, and we need to do it in, in a quick and in, in, and in a correct and, let me say, in an intelligent way. Yes, yes, Torov? Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to, to add to that uh, question yes. here, because that's what we discussed in our presentations and afterwards as well. I think 
whatever we had to do to go through the first wave of uh, the pandemic was that we all developed something regional and local to help us. And now I think maybe it's even the nice part on digital transformation, because if it works as well, or well here, it should actually, if it's a startup or an established company, whatever, if that was a great solution for us, it should be maybe a great solution for Germany. And then if it's a great solution for Germany, it might become a European solution. And then hopefully, and that's actually something I really hope for, yeah, that between the US and China, or we somewhere in between those two, uh, can develop something for us, for us free European citizen that, allows us to share our data, to use our data in an anonymized way. So it could be a yes and no question actually, because we just have to figure out what do we want to share and what is enough to help all of us. So I don't have to share everything about myself, but if there is some information which is anonymized, so it's like, you know, one or 10 million white guys in Europe like me, uh, had this and that, and because they have this and that, if that information helps others, we should share it. Yeah, but from another perspective, Rolf, I totally agree with you, but from another perspective, we should also think about how we can personalize the data, because otherwise, you know, me as a patient, and I, we, we basically in, in my daily practice, we also work with patient organizations. And the number one thing they, they, uh, they are elaborating is that tons of different, you know, resident students, research communities coming to them, question, uh, questioning them some stuff, you know, taking the data and then going back to conduct research. But in the end of the day, it's cool to be a part of a research project, but you also need to get something to yourself. <laughs> so the personalized approach and how we can enable this within the biobank sphere as an example or a clinical sphere. So me as a participant sharing my data and uh, providing consent, as Isabel mentioned, you know, to certain how, where and when, uh, what do I receive from that? And uh, this is also, you know, this is a philosophical question, I think. We can address yeah, that yeah. the panel. We, yeah, we, are, we have just one minute, but I have a question from the audience. Uh, it is a, a, also an expected question. It's, should health insurance companies have free and complete access to data from the proposed common European health data space? Or should this be restricted? And if so, why and how? Does someone have a... a Quick, I did answer quick... that question because for us in the concept of uh, my data, this is just another data consumer, insurance, pharma company, health authorities, whatever. So what is the question? For what? How long are they going to keep the data? Is that going to be anonymized or not? That's it. Yeah. I don't think we should make it a special case. We just need to put the infrastructure yeah. and it's possible to give the control to the people. I think that's what is key. Yeah, I totally thank agree you. with thank Isabel. You. Yeah, thank, thank you very uh, much. Thank you, Emil. John, my data. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much to all. The, the, we have no, no, no more time. It was a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we hope to join in, in, a, in the next, next opportunity. Thank you very much.